Tiana Notis. Tiana Notis was a 25-year-old woman working on her master's degree in communications at the University of Hartford when she met James Carter II on an internet dating site. However, six months into their relationship, James was arrested and sentenced to five months in prison for domestic abuse of a previous girlfriend. James had had previous run-ins with the law, but Tiana was unaware of this. James was convicted of assaults in 2002 and 2006, at least one of which involved domestic violence. When James got out of prison, they both still dated. But in 2008, her relationship with James went south, so Tiana ended it. James apparently was not happy with this decision and continued to stalk her and followed her everywhere. Tiana even got a restraining order against James, but that didn't stop him. James even sent her threatening emails, reading, Trust me, baby girl, you're going to lose everything. As God is my witness, punishment is on the way, so be prepared. Tiana reported this to the police, but they told her that the emails were non-threatening. James continued harassing her with texts, phone calls and emails. She reported this to the police multiple times, but police did not do anything. A few days later, Tiana found her car tires slashed. Tiana was certain that it was James, but police told her that there was no way to prove that James did it. When the police did nothing, Tiana had her father put up a surveillance camera outside of her apartment. Two days later, on February 14, 2009, James took a knife, drove to Tiana's apartment and waited outside for Tiana to return. When Tiana arrived at her apartment, he chased her down and stabbed her about 20 times. The surveillance camera recorded Tiana's screams as James butchered her outside of her apartment. The camera recorded her trying to run away from her killer, but the stabbing itself was not caught on film. Tiana had called 911 and told them that her ex-boyfriend had just stabbed her and she was bleeding to death. Tiana was rushed to the hospital but was pronounced dead later on. Both the 911 call and the surveillance video were shown to the jury. A forensic scientist testified that Tiana's blood was on James's pants. James's own brother testified against him, saying James called him that night and told him that he had stabbed Tiana. However, James never confessed and the knife was never found. James received 60 years in prison and Tiana's murder case helped influence changes to the state's domestic violence laws. Following her murder, Tiana's family filed a wrongful death and negligence lawsuit against the officers for failing to protect Tiana against James Carter II. A jury agreed with the family, awarding a $10 million judgment. Marcy Jo Andrews Marcy Jo Andrews, 24 years old, was last seen alive in Chicago, Illinois on Valentine's Day 1984. She and some friends were in attendance at a holiday party at the home of Casey Nowiski, a man she had never met previously at his house on the 2500 block of West Iowa Street. The friends partied it up with Marcy drinking some beer and smoking some marijuana. Casey, the party's host, offered to drive the woman home in his Volkswagen Rabbit, but on the way, he swerved and crashed into a concrete viaduct. While none of the passengers were seriously hurt, just shaken, Marcy seemed to be the exception. Her ankle appeared broken and she was in immense pain and could not bear weight on it. Casey panicked as he was driving his car uninsured and he feared that he would be in trouble by the police. He gave the other passengers his car keys and some cash and told them to contact a tow company to come get the now undrivable car. He told them he would take Marcy to the hospital to get her ankle checked out. That was the last time her friends ever saw Marcy Joe. She never arrived at the hospital. 
and after calling Casey's home, the location of the Valentine's party, they finally were able to talk to Marcy, who told them with slurred speech that she was scared and wanted to go home. She complained of pain as she had never been seen by a doctor or even taken to the hospital. Her friends went to Casey's home multiple times, but each time they were turned away, with Casey claiming Marcy had left on her own and wasn't there anymore. The loyal friends insisted they would not return his car keys until they could see Marcy, but he refused. In that time, others were allowed in the house, but not Marcy's friends. This refusal of entry continued for multiple days until Casey threatened to kill the girls if they didn't give back the car keys, which frightened them so much that they acquiesced. They never heard from Marcy again, and all of her belongings were left untouched in her home that she shared with her grandmother. Her bank account was untouched and she never picked up her paycheck. Despite the lack of a body, Casey was later arrested and charged with rape and murder. This arrest came almost 16 years after Marcy's disappearance and was possible due to witness statements by Michael John Panacey, who recalls he saw Marcy chained to the radiator of Casey's home, naked and too drugged out to respond. Michael testified that Casey was actually a drug dealer and that he, Michael, had stopped by the house to purchase drugs. When he saw Marcy chained up, he freed her and dressed her and gave her some food. But she was still very much out of it. He also recalls the disturbing fact that while he was there, another customer of Casey's came by and, in addition to purchasing from Casey, also sexually assaulted Marcy. Another unnamed witness corroborated the fact that he too had seen Marcy chained up to a radiator completely unclothed the day after Valentine's Day. Michael came back to the apartment the next day, only to hear a truly terrifying statement from Casey. She died on me, he claimed. Michael says that Casey told him Marcy had too much THC, the active component in marijuana. But being that no one has ever overdosed to the point of death on THC, it seems highly unlikely that it was the only drug involved in her passing. Michael begged Casey to call the police, but he refused. Casey then asked Michael to help carry the body down to the car, but Michael refused, and Casey became angry and told him to never come back there again. Michael recalls Casey putting Marcy in the back of his mother's car, a 1974 Maverick, and drove away. Years later, before being prosecuted, multiple people would tell police that they heard Casey tell people that he had raped and strangled Marcy and that her body would never be found. Many searches had been conducted in Casey's apartment and nearby in a family farm, but Marcy's body has never been recovered. Casey was convicted of rape and murder in 2005, more than 20 years after Marcy went missing and is currently serving life in prison. Susan Hamilton Dr. John Hamilton was a talented obstetrician and gynecologist in Oklahoma City. When he met Susan in 1985, they both were divorced and both had two children from their previous marriages. The couple married two years later. Susan managed John's abortion clinic working there two days a week, but it came at a price. It was a job that attracted criticism in the conservative state. There were anti-abortion protests, and Susan received threatening calls. On Valentine's Day, Dr. John Hamilton ordered an expensive bouquet of flowers for Susan, but she would never live to see them. On that day, John called 911 to report that he allegedly found his wife lying in a pool of her own blood. Hamilton told the operator that he was attempting to perform CPR on her. When police arrived, they observed Hamilton doing chest compressions on his wife's body. She had been strangled with two of his own neckties and had her skull beaten so badly that the pieces of her brain were exposed. There was blood all over the bathroom, as well as a rag which had seemingly been used to wipe out some of the blood. 
before the killer abandoned the hasty cleanup attempt and left. The unknown weapon used to kill her was never found. At first, police thought that the murder was committed by anti-abortion activists. But as the investigation moved forward, they found some suspicious clues that made John their prime suspect. John said he had tried mouth to mouth, but there was none of Susan's blood on his face despite her facial injuries. At crime scene, there was no sign of forced entry, nothing stolen or no bloody footprints leading away from the carnage. The police also found the Valentine's card that Susan had given her husband that morning. Inside, the message read, I bought this two weeks ago, so I guess maybe it doesn't seem as appropriate. But I do love you. Have a great day, Susan. Her words made police question whether the marriage was as perfect as it seemed. One of Susan's friends revealed that the couple had argued. After Susan had confronted John and possibly threatened divorce, when she found out dozens of phone calls between him and an exotic dancer. John had explained that the young woman was one of his patients who was having a mental breakdown and threatening suicide and he was attempting to console her in the calls. When police asked about John's whereabouts on the day of the murder, he claimed that he had performed two surgeries that morning at different hospitals. First at 7 a.m. which ended just after 8 a.m. He then went to the second hospital where he met a fellow medical partner at 8.30 a.m. After which he stopped by his house for a brief period to speak to his wife and then left for his 9 a.m. surgery, giving him not much time to commit the murder. None of John's colleagues at the second hospital noticed anything unusual in his demeanor. They described him as jovial and he performed the surgery without a hitch. However, they did say that John was 30 minutes late for his second operation. John was immediately arrested and charged with Susan's murder. Police also found that after the murder, when Hamilton was brought in for questioning, Hamilton was excessively emotional in front of the detectives, as if he was acting. On the day of the trial, prosecutors said that on the day of the murder, after performing his first surgery, John returned to his house and then bludgeoned Susan to death. While John was cleaning up with a rag found at the scene, he was paged to perform the surgery at the hospital. So he left, carrying the murder weapon with him and dumping it on the way. He then returned back later to discover the body. Investigators had found blood, hair and tissue belonging to Susan in Dr. Hamilton's car. Hamilton's explanation was that he realized his car was blocking the driveway where the ambulance needed to get in, so he ran outside to move it, but his hands were shaking too badly to start the ignition, and that's how Susan's blood, hair and tissue got inside his car. While loved ones were sorting through Susan's clothes, they found some of her jewelry hidden in her underwear, almost as if someone wanted the police to think a robbery had taken place. John claimed that he placed the jewelry there because he was afraid paramedics or the police would steal it. The prosecution presented blood spatter analysts that claimed that spatter patterns were found on Hamilton's shoes and shirt which could only come from being present in the room as Susan was bludgeoned to death. The defense countered that Hamilton had been kneeling in a pool of blood doing CPR on Susan's body and the spatter marks in question could be explained by blood spraying out of her mouth as he performed chest compressions. However, Hamilton defense team's own blood spatter analyst stated in a cross-examination that he had found blood on the inside of Hamilton's sleeve, which the prosecution had missed. He said he thought the blood pattern was consistent with what would have happened if Hamilton struck his wife and he didn't think it came from giving CPR. The jury took two hours to find John guilty of first-degree murder. He was later sentenced to life in prison without the chance of a parole. Tara Lynn Grant On February 14, 2007, 
Stay at home dad Stephen Grant called the Macomb County Sheriff's office in Michigan to report that his wife Tara Lynn Grant had been missing for 5 days. Tara and Stephen lived in Washington Township, Michigan with their two children ages 4 and 6. Tara was employed as an operations manager for Washington Group International, an engineering, construction and management company based in Idaho. with offices in Troy, Michigan. She had been with the company for over 10 years. In his account to the police, Steven said that Tara traveled a lot for work to San Juan, Puerto Rico and was scheduled to go back to Puerto Rico on Sunday, February 11th. He claimed that on the evening of February 9, he and Tara had an argument about her traveling too much for the job. He then overheard Tara talking with someone on the phone. telling them i will meet you at the end of the driveway and then left the house a few minutes later he said he saw her getting into a dark sedan at the end of the driveway he did not hear from her again and reported her missing on the 14th steven claimed that this was not the first time tara had taken off which is why he hadn't reported her missing sooner over the next 2 weeks steven made several tv appearances pleading for Tara to return. According to police, Steven was not cooperative with them throughout the investigation. However, he did agree to take a polygraph test as long as it was administered by someone other than the police. The next day, Steven was stopped by the police and arrested for driving with a suspended license. He accused police of using traffic arrest as an excuse to take him into custody for further questioning about Tara's disappearance. Police deny the accusation. Steven has had other brushes with the law, notably an arrest in October of 1989 for reckless driving and carrying a concealed weapon. These charges were reduced to careless driving and failure to get a permit for a handgun. He paid a fine and served no jail time. On March 2, 2007, Police executed a search warrant at the home of Steven and Tara Grant. When the police arrived at the Steven's house, he asked if he can take the dog for a walk. As Steven walks out of the house and into the cold winter night, the case takes a gruesome turn. While searching his house, police discovered Tara Grant's dismembered body hidden in a plastic bin in his garage. An arrest warrant was immediately issued for Steven Grant. Steven fled to North Michigan but was captured a few days later. Wearing only pants, shirt and socks in the frigid northern Michigan weather, Steven was suffering from minor frostbite and hypothermia at the time of his capture. Steven was taken into custody and airlifted to a Northern Michigan hospital where he was hospitalized for a brief period of time. During his hospitalization, he confessed to the crime. He said that he killed his wife during an argument after she had slapped and belittled him. He had strangled her to death and then dragged her body to the garage while their two children were asleep. He later dismembered and dispersed parts of her body to Stony Creek Metro Park in Shelby Township. But when he heard that there would be a police search in the area, he took parts of the body back to his garage. On Friday, December 21, 2007, Stephen was found guilty and charged with second-degree murder. He was later sentenced to 50 to 80 years in prison. Denise Luthold. On February 14, 2013, Nathan Luthold picked up his 4-year-old daughter from preschool and returned to the home he was sharing with his wife, Denise Luthold, and their three children. Nathan and his wife had been Baptist missionaries at some point. The family had also brought in a Lithuanian exchange student named Aina Dobilaite to live there for a short time. The Luthholds had met Aina in her native country when she was 6 years old on one of their missionary trips. When Aina was 18, Nathan sponsored her and she moved to United States to attend college. That day on February 14, 2013, The police of Peoria received a distressed call from Nathan Luthold claiming that someone had broken into his house. When the police arrived, they found the body of Denise Luthold 
lying in a pool of blood with a single gunshot wound to the head. However, to the police, the supposed ransacking looked staged. The kitchen drawers had been carefully placed on the ground. A fair amount of cash was still lying around the house and electronics belonging to Nathan were still sitting in an open view. Nathan was questioned and he told police he had left the house around 11.15 or 11.30 that morning. When his wife failed to pick up his daughter from preschool and she wasn't responding to calls or text messages, he contacted family members but no one had heard from her. After picking up his daughter, Luthol said he pulled into the driveway at approximately 3 p.m. and noticed that the garage door was open and empty. He got out, walked into the garage and saw a broken window. But instead of going inside, he returned to his car, backed into a neighbor's driveway and called police. Nathan went through the house and confirmed several items in addition to Denise's vehicle were missing, including two rings, a laptop computer, a digital camera and two handguns, a 40 caliber Glock and a 22. The missing car was soon located in a nearby parking lot. Diane Parrish, one of the neighbors, said she saw a man wearing a black hoodie with the hoodie pulled up walking along Mosswell Road at approximately 12.20 p.m. on Valentine's Day. Police also discovered a note in Denise's day planner, which she apparently intended to give to her husband, complaining about their marriage and accusing him of humiliating her by running around with a 20-year-old. She even stated that she was sure he wanted her dead. This letter made investigators suspect Nathan. They soon found out that Nathan and Ina were very close. At the time of the murder, she was living in Chicago, 165 miles from Peoria. But she and Luthold shared a bank account and Nathan paid 90% of her expenses. It was also found that Ina had enrolled at Florida Christian College but was kicked out for an inappropriate relationship with Nathan Luthold. When police pulled out phone records of Nathan and Ina, they found that both of them exchanged multiple text messages and calls every day. There were numerous texts and emails that suggested their relationship wasn't platonic in any way. About a month before the murder, Nathan had sent an email to Ina that began with, I let you down and stated how he vowed to work harder on their relationship. The police began to suspect that Nathan killed Denise so that Nathan and Ina could be together. In 2013, he was 38 and she was 21. Both Nathan and Ina denied that they were having an affair and dismissed having a joint account. During the investigation, police also found a black hooded sweatshirt in Nathan and Denise's bedroom. Similar to the one a strange man was seen wearing in the neighborhood around the time of the murder. More damaging evidence was discovered when Nathan's computer was examined by forensic technicians. The search history revealed someone had conducted searches on how to kill a person by insulin injection and electrocuting them in a bathtub. There were other searches on how to silence a 40 caliber Glock. On May 6, 2013, just three weeks after the murder of his wife, Nathan Luthold was arrested. During his trial on July 14, 2014, an inmate who claimed to have become friends with Nathan in the county jail said that Nathan had told him that he had waited in the hall closet for Denise to return home from taking their four-year-old daughter to her afternoon preschool class. He then emerged from the closet having a brief argument with her and then he shot her. He had apparently ransacked the home prior to her arrival. He then fled on foot to his car that he had parked at a nearby park and changed out of his black hooded sweatshirt. On September 27, 2014, the jury found him guilty of murder and sentenced him to 80 years in prison.